The word yet, if you think about it, some of the challenges that people may be experiencing as they transition to college. So maybe they feel like they don't know their way around. Yet, that really does change the way we think about it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Fergal Fox and today we're speaking with Dr. Ekna Hunt, who's occupational therapist and college lecturer in University College Cork about healthy habits for university life. You're very welcome to the podcast, Etna. Thanks very much, Fergal, for the invitation. So Etna, we got referred to your work by Carolyn Mahan, who coordinates the Healthy Campus work with the Higher Education Authority. You spoke at a recent conference with the Healthy Campus stakeholders and it was felt that your learning was very significant for wider application and communication. In terms of healthy habits for university life, how have you been looking at it yourself in, in your work? So I've been working as an academic member of staff in UCC for over 20 years now, and I have a clinical background in child and adolescent mental health. So the average age of students in college now for both undergraduate and postgraduate is 23 and the average age for undergraduates is 20. So I feel very fortunate that my teaching and my research and my past clinical background all now overlap. And I feel lucky that I have a a good understanding of some of the issues that our students are facing nowadays. The work that I referred to at my presentation at the Healthy Campus Conference in June was in relation to the work I've done recently with colleagues on applying a developmental perspective to teaching and learning in higher education and the program that I developed around time use and well-being called Everyday Matters, Healthy Habits for University Life. So you developed this program down in UCC and you've done some research on it in terms of its application. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So I launched the program in person in 2019 and we did a small feasibility study And the results of that were very positive. Of course, then COVID happened in early 2020. So I adapted the programme for online delivery. And with some financial support from Bank of Ireland, we evaluated the programme across 2021 to 2023 and used matched pre and post data from just under 100 students, both undergraduate and postgraduate across a range of disciplines. And I used standardised measures for all of the the data collection. So we looked at things like sleep, health, self-compassion, growth mindset, occupational balance, mental well-being, and we found improvements in all of the measures. And the quality of feedback from the students who completed the programme is overwhelmingly positive. It seems to really resonate with them, which is very exciting. We'll get into the content in a minute, but it certainly seemed impressive to me that you've tried to take very practical skills, living skills, yeah. together. As you said yourself, you've got a deep understanding of who you're dealing with yeah. here. Young people mm-hmm. who've been through you know, different experiences and are coming to a point in their lives where, you know, there's an increased expectation on them, increased independence, but there may be an increased vulnerability. Yes. Yeah. So one important aspect of the work that I do is a focus on really trying to make, as you say, practical recommendations, but scientifically evidence-based. So a big part of my PhD work, which underpins the Everyday Matters program, is on really understanding time use across the full 24 hours of the day. And that really underpins the Everyday Matters program. But each week, students get very practical takeaways to try and experiment with. Two practical tips that I give to students at this time of year. One is to get a week to view diary so they can get a bird's eye view of their week as a whole. And the second is to buy an alarm clock not to rely on their phone as their means of waking up. So sleep really underpins everything. The programme is giving bite-sized information in the forms of videos, reading, some reflective activities and recorded lectures. And then students get to engage with the content over the course of the following week and experiment with making tweaks. I also use the work of Dr. BJ Fogg and use a method called tiny habits. So to really try and choose and and practice and implement doable things. And the feedback from the participants in the program is that they find that firstly, that it makes sense conceptually for them to think about their time use across the 24 hours of the day, because oftentimes and health promotion messaging is often very siloed. 
So we might think, yes, we give messages around physical activity. We give messages around sleep. We give messages about healthy eating. But the challenge for most people is not necessarily hearing those messages, but it's implementing that information in the context of their day-to-day life. So students find the conceptual framework helpful, thinking about their time use across the full 24 hours of the day. So we talk about sleep, self-care, play and leisure and study and work. But then they also find the bite-sized evidence-based strategies and tips very helpful and not overwhelming. So they can, you know, experiment, be curious, try things out. And it seems to really work. I'd like to go through the eight tips that you've shared with me that you've taken from the program or you, you kind of integrate into the mm. program as part of your message. And I think these would be very useful to our listeners. You have mentioned some yeah. of them there, but I like the blend that you're talking about there and you're focusing on implementation, which is often the doing of the advice is, is where the challenge is. Absolutely. And you, you've considered that in some depth. So in terms of the tips for preparing mm-hmm. for learning and life at university, the mm-hmm. first one I see you have here is know before you go. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes. So, and I was only speaking with colleagues this morning whose children are um, due to start at university. I think a big challenge for students who are preparing to come to university and settling into university is the different expectation of them. So I think it's really important for all students to try and find out as much as possible about their chosen program of study, whether that's by looking at materials on the the internet. But particularly at this time of year, I would encourage all students to prioritise attending their orientation sessions. A lot of work goes into trying to put together a programme of orientation that meets the needs of students. And it's critical to be able to, to meet the academic staff, to put faces to their names, to hopefully get a tour of the campus and the buildings, to meet peer support leaders and to meet your new classmates. So I would prioritise and sometimes I think people are busy and and maybe they're commuting. It's a really rich opportunity and um, I wouldn't discount it. And even if you're living, I'm in UCC and we have students from obviously Cork, Kerry, Waterford, Limerick, Dublin and further afield. And sometimes people are making cost benefit analysis on the fly in terms of, well, okay, orientations, you know, it's a couple of hours, not a full day. And do I have to do, I should have really traveled to college to go for it. I would say 100%. Yeah, yes. yeah I, I second that. It's very high value and it's not appreciated until it's experienced, yeah. I guess. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. And you're alluding to one of the, the next point, number two of your tips there. You mentioned about meeting your classmates. Like I think that orientation mm. space the uncertainty of that is a great opportunity to meet people and say hello to complete strangers. Exactly, exactly. And that's something that many of us find tricky. Yeah. You know, and even if somebody may appear to be extremely confident and at ease, we never actually know how somebody is feeling inside. So I would strongly encourage people if they're joining into a room or a lecture theatre, taking the brave step of turning to the person beside them and go, hello. My name is Ethna. Are you doing occupational therapy or whatever course? Some classes, of course, will be just your cohort on your program. But for example, my occupational therapy students will take anatomy lectures or physiology lectures with some other disciplines. So, you know, you may not be sitting with somebody who's on your registered program. I think loneliness, we know, is a huge threat to well-being that is increasingly recognised. And sometimes we think that young people are hyper connected and they can't be lonely. But some of the recent data show that, in fact, it is college age students who report the highest levels of loneliness. And we know that social relationships are the biggest predictor of well-being in the long term. So it's so important to invest in them. I think, unfortunately, while I think COVID, obviously for all of us across the world, presented enormous challenges, some benefits in terms of offering more flexibility in in learning approaches and learning contexts for people. But I think by necessity, we had to get used to operating behind a screen. Maybe we got a bit rusty in terms of our social skills for initiating conversations and, and using eye contact and using body language to really show interest. 
So try and push yourself out of your comfort zone. Everybody is in the same boat. They want to be getting to know people yeah. and making friends and connections. I love the sentence after the point and the tips that I have in front of me here. Try and get comfortable introducing yourself to others by name, especially during the first few weeks of lectures and smile when you do so. <laughs> Just yeah. that offer yourself in a warm engagement and that's it. much more likely to be received in a warm way. But that's it. We're all human. And yeah. sometimes that can feel risky making that connection. But think about it in the reverse. If somebody is to come up to you and say, hi, my name is, and they seem warm and interested. Yeah. How do you feel? You're probably chuffed, chuffed yeah. that somebody has said hello. Absolutely. OK, moving on to number three here is finding your tribe. That's that's a big focus for a lot of people at third level. I think this is the world is going to open up to me now. I'm going to find my tribe. It's It's great to name it, I guess, and say, you know, the world is your oyster in third level. That can be the expectation. And for many students, that is the case. Not for all. And I think that's important to name too. People will experience engagement and the sense of belongingness across all ends of the continuum, from not managing to feel that they belong to people who absolutely flourish in both the academic or the social contexts of college. I would say to people that it takes time, yeah. that it's very unlikely you're going to sit beside somebody and, you know, connect with them and, you know, they're your friends for life. It takes time and consistent effort. I think sometimes in higher education universities in Ireland, people are maybe commuting and, and we know so many factors that are contributing to that, not least the, the challenge of accommodation. But if people are commuting, what can happen is that people don't either value or they're not able to engage in extracurricular activities because they might be traveling home or they have their part-time job. I think trying to look at all the aspects, both through the curriculum and, you know, labs and tutorials and all of aspects of the, the teaching and learning, and then trying to look at the experience in the round. And, and again, you know, whether it's choosing to, to get involved in one club or one society, trying to see how you can find your people, but knowing that it takes time. OK, that's good. Good advice. So the number four is yet add this three letter word to your vocab at the end of sentences. That's advice on it's a bit of what you were just saying there. Have patience with yourself. That's right. So this three letter word, um, people may be familiar with it, often associated with the work of Carol Dweck, whose scholarship really became the theory of growth mindset. And that's the idea that we are not born with a fixed level of intelligence. Rather, our intelligence can grow by a range of different means and not just hard work. So the earlier understandings of growth mindset was if you work hard enough, you will get the results. And certainly effort and consistency are very important. But we also know in, in thinking about growth mindset that asking for help really, really matters. So availing of support, getting feedback, that all matters. But the word yet, if you think about it, some of the challenges that people may be experiencing as they transition to college so maybe they feel like they don't know their way around yet. That really does change the it way does, we yeah. think about Absolutely, it. Yeah. It's very powerful. So I think the challenge is for people is to kind of understand the theory that underpins that. It's that we learn. We learn and grow all of the time. It's very powerful to know that. And then if you have the, the mental awareness and try and catch yourself, if you hear yourself saying, I haven't a clue how to get to the library. Or I haven't a clue how to do academic referencing, which is often one of the biggest challenges for students as they come into higher education is it's, it's very tricky to learn. Even I'm at this a long time and I find it tricky to learn. But if you say, yeah, I haven't got the hang of it yet. It's just it's, giving it's yourself very the powerful. patience. Yeah. The other thing just to add with regard to the whole scholarship of growth mindset is that it has expanded beyond growth mindset to include purpose and relevance and belonging. Purpose and relevance, I think it's really about encouraging students to think about, OK, this is my program of study that I've chosen. Most likely I've worked very hard to get here. So really try and think about, you know, what do I want to get out of it and how can I maximize the benefit for myself? And then the other aspect of learning mindsets that the research is showing really influence positive outcomes in education is belongingness. So again, going back to the tribe and smiling at people and saying hello it, yeah. it really matters okay the point five you have here is a bit similar to that one but it's for now two mm -hmm. more powerful three-letter words 
if you're feeling overwhelmed yeah. to reassure yourself with kindness. This is like the self-compassion you mentioned. Exactly. So in the Everyday Matters program, we have aspects of time use. So the sleep, self-care, play and leisure, study and work. And then we have positive habits of mind, including growth mindset or learning mindsets that we've just covered. And the second habit of mind that we discuss and, and examine the research underpinning it is self-compassion. It's very likely that students will feel overwhelmed at some time over their transition period. And feeling overwhelmed is very unpleasant and it can be all consuming. You know, we tend to lose our perspective. It's very important if people can ground themselves and say, this is how I'm feeling for now. So the idea of self-compassion, the work of, of Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer, identifies three aspects of self-compassion. One is mindfulness, so that in the very first instance, you can know how you're feeling yeah. without blowing it out of proportion and without dismissing it. So it's not to say, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm never going to get a handle on college, I may as well give up. It's completely ridiculous that I'm feeling overwhelmed right now. I, sh I shouldn't be feeling this way. So mindfulness is the first step in self-compassion. The second step is common humanity, essentially saying we are all human. So while it may look as if everybody else has it sorted and is acing their assignments yeah. and is, you know, flourishing socially, it's highly unlikely to be the case. It's much more likely that everybody else can relate exactly to the experiences you're having. One powerful activity that I do in my orientation session with my first year occupational therapy students is we use Mentimeter, which is Online. they can anonymously populate the screen with their responses to any prompt. And I ask them for three feelings for how they're feeling right now. We do it at the start of the session. And in equal measure, pretty much the word cloud that generates is um, nervous and excited. But often nervous is bigger and words like overwhelmed, unsure, stressed out. So then we go through orientation. We talk about expectations. We talk about what it's like, talk a little bit about the, the supports. And at the end, I do another three word check in. And people find it so reassuring to hear that other people feel stressed and overwhelmed at times, specifically around the transition to college. So that's very powerful stuff. The third element of self-compassion is that we offer ourselves kindness. And that's either through coming up with a phrase where we say, yeah, you know, may I be calm or, you know, this will pass and offering ourselves physical gestures of kindness. So tending, I suppose, to our mind and to our body. The scholarship of self-compassion is absolutely fascinating. It is so compelling in terms of the benefits that it affords. And we think self-compassion might be a selfish act, but in fact, People who practice self-compassion are likely to be more compassionate to other people, learn better, live longer, sleep better, eat better. It's very, very compelling. Well, wow, that's good. The number six you have here is when in doubt, breathe out. Yeah. So these are all linked in a way, but this is another practical thing about take a beat, is it? Yeah. This is very specifically around the physiology of anxiety, actually. So what we've covered are some of them were the kind of mental aspects. But I think it's very helpful for people to know, firstly, that anxiety is entirely normal. If you feel anxious, it does not mean that there's something wrong with you. I think one of the challenges in contemporary society is that sometimes we label everyday experiences using quite pathological terminology. So we might say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm having a panic attack about that. Yeah. If I like to clean my desk, I have OCD because I like to clean my desk. So I think we need to be careful yeah. about our language. I can see that's a dangerous, dangerous trend towards medicalizing or put mental health into our daily lives a bit too much. It's a big challenge. And I think a lot of mental health promotion activities obviously are, are very well intended, but there's interesting research emerging and, and the work of Lucy Fuchs in the UK looking at are there risks associated with some of the mental health awareness activities that are run and how can we ensure there's a balanced narrative around this and pathologizing everyday emotional experiences and creating an expectation that if you're well, it means that you feel great all of the time. Like that's not real life. Yeah. You know, but specifically around anxiety, because we hear about it so much and we meet many students who are experiencing anxiety. 
And just wearing my mental health hat and anxiety in and of itself is not a problem, nor is low mood or, or any of these things. However, if they are impacting on somebody's ability to participate in their daily life, that is when it's getting to a level where it may be problematic. At the lower end of the spectrum, if people know, yes, it's anxiety is entirely normal. And if they understand the physiology of anxiety, and this, when in doubt, breathe out, is one of the most powerful. We often say to people, relax, take a few deep breaths, and you'll feel better. If we tell people to focus on breathing out, it resets the ratio of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood, in the bloodstream. And it's really, really critical for bringing physiological ease. Yeah, another good tip. And number seven, you have uh, tried to set realistic goals. And the tip is about being good enough. Your, yeah. your first assignment in college, you don't have to be the best. Aim to do your mm -hmm. best. Aim to do your best, for sure, with the caveat that we also need to know what is good enough. In preparation for our conversation, thinking about all of the, the media attention to the results and the grade inflation, a big challenge for students when they're transitioning to higher education is, in most cases, moving from a secondary school environment where they were probably in with people of a range of abilities. But by virtue of the CAO point system, when you get to college, you're in a cohort of people who are performing, you know, pretty much at the same level as you. I think to have realistic expectations of college is really important and to expect that you will see a reduction in your results. So if maybe if you have been getting the H1s, we don't see very much of that in the university. We see a much more of a normal distribution curve where, you know, the majority of people will get it. Some people will really get it and share their knowledge very convincingly. And some people won't get it yet. Very good. You're integrating your advice there with your yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the last tip here is it's one of the key ones. And you've mentioned it already that sleep is your superpower. A lot of research around this and it's definitely come up before on our podcast. I think it's something that people have heard, but it kind of links into that implementation problem that you mentioned. Certainly for me, yeah. that's easier said than done. Oh, for sure. For sure. We tend to think that sleep is the discretionary part of our day. We will sleep when everything else is taken care of. And sometimes we can get away with that, you know, for short bursts of time, maybe for cramming for an exam or have a big, important work deadline. You know, we might get away with a few nights of really sleep insufficiency. But the data show that the toll is significant even in the short term. But we know for certain that in the medium and long term, I would urge students to really protect their sleep. Now it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult in college. Maybe people are living away from home and have much more flexibility determining their schedule than ever before. And there's a lot to fit in, you know, college activities and maybe part-time work or family commitments and socializing. But the scholarship of, of sleep and the sleep science literature is absolutely fascinating. And they're really showing that it's vital for learning, it's vital for physical well-being, it's vital for cognitive well-being, the links between sleep insufficiency and dementia, for example. It's vital for weight regulation. It's fundamental, isn't it? It's absolutely fundamental. That's why I tell everybody, get an alarm clock. Do not have your phone as your yeah. alarm clock. That's a mistake that a lot of people make, isn't it? Bring the phone to bed. It's a it's a big problem. It's a big problem. And, you know, you can buy an alarm clock in Dunn's or Tesco or Eurogiant for a couple of euros, less than a price of a cup of coffee, I would yeah. say. Yeah. And actually, one year UCC did do this. We had a little bit of money. And in one of the activities that we did, instead of giving out merch like a coffee cup, for example, we gave out alarm clocks. Just to give another practical support. I think those tips are fantastic, Edna. I really appreciate you sharing them with us. Can you tell us a bit more about how your program, Everyday Matters, how you've kind of implemented it with students, online processes and to get people to engage with it? Yeah. When COVID happened, we had to pivot online. So I migrated all of the content online. So it's now available once per semester for UCC students. Once they register, I release the content weekly on a Monday 
the reason for that is I don't want people to kind of binge engage with the content just to get the the micro credential for their LinkedIn or for their CV. That's interesting that you've done that as well. I just wanted to highlight that, that you've you developed a micro credential around this. So you've attached it to the learning journey, but it's all about yeah. well-being and integrating it into the learning journey and the, the life journey. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So it's currently available to UCC students as a digital micro-credential. I would love to see Everyday Matters as a fully credit-bearing module within the programme offerings in UCC or other institutions. And that would certainly be a goal that I'm kind of exploring and working towards. But for the moment, it's available through our Academic Skills Centre, through the UCC Skills Centre. The learner effort, as it's called, is about eight hours. So there's about one hour's content for each of the themes. So the first week is looking at neuroplasticity and time use. Then we have sleep, self-care, play and leisure, study and work as the four aspects of 24-hour time use. And then we have the learning mindsets, the self-compassion and joy and gratitude. So students can engage with it. It's available on Canvas. It's set up so that the content unlocks sequentially. And then at the end, students are required to submit a short reflection on a reflective framework called What, So What, Now What?, to get them to think about, you know, what have they learned and how they will apply it going forward. And then they get their micro-credential, which they can put on their LinkedIn or or on their CV. And employers increasingly are recognising the importance of well-being. In fact, resilience, flexibility and agility are amongst the top 10 skills identified by the World Economic Forum in their Future of Jobs report. This is important stuff and, and very important for learning. I like the piece that you've included there around play, um, mm. you know, that you referred to it earlier on in ways like sometimes students come and they think I, I need to kind of put the head down. I need yeah. to study my ass off like I did for my leaving cert. I'm going to, you yeah. know, everything's going to be fantastic. But like, yeah. you know, parsing up your time management skills and making time for that social play or that, you know, that it's not just for kindergarten or for preschool. You no. know, play is important for everybody. Play is absolutely critical. And I use the work of a psychiatrist called Marie Asgard in Everyday Matters, and we look at the exhaustion funnel right. and how, you know, when we're under crunch times, we our activities tend to become reduced. And in most cases, it's around work activities. So sleep is often the first thing to go. Then probably fun activities. We kind of think, oh, I don't have time to meet up with my friends or go out for a drink or go to the cinema or go to GAA or whatever. And if they funnel downwards, it can lead to exhaustion. We really place a value on play and leisure. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 soft and not as important when you're describing it there and, and going over the evidence. Very important part of our resilience, isn't it? It certainly is. Etna, I'd like to thank you for sharing your information and you've given us so many insights to the research that you've looked up and integrated into your program development. I really appreciate you sharing your tips and everything. It'll be very useful for students and parents and people working in the sector. Thank you, Fergal. It's been lovely to have this opportunity to talk. So just before we go, I want to highlight that next year in 2025, the International Health Promotion Campus Conference is taking place in University of Limerick, UL in June uh, 2025, in collaboration with Atlantic Technological University, St. Angela's, with support from the Higher Education Authority. So Ireland is a member of the International Health and Morton Campuses Committee, and through a competitive international process, UL and ATU were chosen to host the conference. So that's a big deal for the healthy campus work in Ireland next year, where they'll be hosting that international conference. And the conference theme next year is a decade after the Okanagan Charter, which has been a key piece of the development of healthy campus work. So anybody working in that area, keep an eye out for that information next year. To all our listeners, thank you for your continued support. Please share this episode with somebody you think would get value out of it. If you'd like more information about HSE Health and Wellbeing, follow us on X, take a look at our YouTube channel or register for our e-zine by emailing healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.e. And finally, just again, I'd like to thank Dr. Etna Hunt for joining me today to talk about this very important subject. Goodbye.